Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Friday, April 17th, 2020. There's a whole lot of news to comment on today, including that California may be headed into a drought, a long-term drought that's only occurred twice in recorded history. The last one in, was in the 16th century. Ouch. But I start the podcast today on a hopeful note. The U.N. Security Council is embracing, it appears, the call of Secretary General Guterres, who over a month ago said, look, there's a pandemic raging the world. Let's call a truce in all military hostilities around the entire planet. And that was ignored by the New York. You heard me report on it, and I I noted that there was a huge silence in the corporate media about this. And now at the prodding of French President Emmanuel Macron, not my favorite world leader, he says that he has secured the agreement of several of the five permanent members of the U.N. Security Council to back that call by Antonio Guterres for a global ceasefire. In an interview earlier this week, Macron said that he has assurances from the leaders of China, the United Kingdom, his own country, get this, the United States. Macron reported that President Trump confirmed his agreement to me. Now, that's the weakest link in this chain, because Trump will do anything for optics. But it's hard for me to believe that the U.S. will really sign on to that. And, of course, will a country like Saudi Arabia that announced a phony ceasefire with the Houthi rebels in Yemen a couple of weeks ago that broke down almost immediately? And to be fair, the Houthis had never agreed to it. It was a unilateral announcement that appeared to advantage the kingdom. And so we may have uh, some sort of photo op that declares that we're going to have a temporary peace. But that's hard to rely upon. According to the New York Times, the U.S. is considering pulling back frontline CIA personnel from bases in Afghanistan. And this is an attempt to break the stalemate in negotiations that have been bizarre to begin with because the U.S. has been negotiating exclusively with the Taliban, uh, keeping whatever remains of the Afghan government and whoever claims to be president today out of the room. But Taliban leaders have demanded reductions in CIA presence in the country alongside American troops, something that until now American negotiators have resisted. But it appears we may be reconsidering that posture. And I I hate to say this, but we need to wind down the war in Afghanistan. We've been there for 19 years come September or October. And it's a lose-lose situation. And I think Trump is looking to find a way to uh, declare peace. He can't declare victory and get American presence sharply reduced so he can say that he ended our involvement in Afghanistan this coming November. But the ugly truth is that one way or another, we're going to walk out of there and leave the various forces to compete with each other, and the big losers will be women who have gained rights under the U.S. occupation that are unlikely to survive when the U.S. exits. And another point of contention, if Trump actually has told Macron, oh, sure, ceasefire, sounds good. Whitney Webb, in an article published today at Mint Press News, and she is now writing for another outlet called The Last American Vagabond. I went to their website, and she appears to be the only uh, regular But I respect her journalism, and she's been on this podcast several times. And she cites Michael Hudson, who's a president of the Institute for the Study of Long-Term Economic Trends and a former Wall Street financial analyst. 
He teaches economics at the University of Missouri. And he is saying that the U.S. is in bad shape because we have reached peak shale oil. And, of course, Trump's instinct is to rescue America's oil sector in any way he can. And Webb makes a strong argument that because of the drop in oil prices, the impending collapse of fracking and the shale oil enterprises, because that crap is so expensive to dig out of the ground and refine, that we may be lurking in front of a Panama-style invasion of Venezuela. And she says it's not only a possibility, but increasingly likely. So I've shared the link to her piece, and I encourage you to read it because I think it is well-researched. I think the comparisons to Panama, when Poppy Bush invaded and made Manuel Noriega the enemy of the world, after he'd been on the CIA payroll for... (laughs) long, long time, and we knew he was running drugs through there. It was just a convenient excuse to take over and retain control of the Panama Canal. And in this case, the efforts against Venezuela, which is the nation with the largest oil reserves on the planet, and it's a kind of crude oil that's not as uh, uh, hard to process into fuels, as shale oil is. Now, shifting sub, Linda Lewis, who, you know, contributes a lot to this podcast related to the pandemic, sent me an article today that I want to get to your attention here early in the podcast because it relates to a lot of other stories in the news. Now, there have been a lot of efforts, and they continue to this moment, mostly coming from right-wing pundits, who President Trump watches on TV or (laughs) listens to on the radio or gets nightly phone calls from people like Sean Hannity. And they keep saying, you know, this this COVID-19, it's no worse than the flu. And, you know, we don't shut down the country because of heart disease or automobile accidents. And this study comes from a group the writers are Ari Shulman, Brendan Fote, and Samuel Matlack. Their website is the New Atlantis, a journal of technology and society. And they make some really important points. And the first that caught my attention is just this graph. Who reported deaths on a weekly basis in New York State? And they track, first of all, the flu and pneumonia from the 2017-2018 cycle, which was the most deadly in the last few years. It's at the bottom of this graph that I'm looking at. Then next up is all deaths from all causes during that 2017-18 flu season. That's in the middle of the chart. And, of course, those trend lines go from left to right to cover the entire year. But COVID-19 comes up in the uh, like the third, third week of the year, in late January. And the line just goes straight up in a very, very quick process. And it is that alarming spread of a disease that is difficult to detect symptoms in many people. And it is not, we don't know exactly you know, how it's transmitted or in what ways it moves from one person to the next. We have good, you know, guesstimates about that. And so this really sharply illustrates why there was grave concern among people who were objective about this and why it led to the stay-at-home orders that many people are chafing under today couple of quotes here. The number of new deaths reported in the U.S. in the week beginning March 16th was 678 percent higher than the previous week. In New York, uh, New York State, not just the city, the number grew 36-fold that same week. 
By comparison, the worst one-week increase during the 2017-18 flu season was 24 percent. And they have to go back to 57 and 58, 1957 and 58 Asian flu when it was 48 percent. Again, compared to 678 percent. So when you hear, and I have uh, people like Rush Limbaugh and Laura Ingram and all these people who get their talking points from the White House, try to minimize this, and they use this <laughs> illogical construction that appears to work with right-wing people who apparently can't get into deeper thinking. And because the mitigation efforts, for example, here in California and in Washington State, as compared with New York State, have actually worked, they now turn around and say, oh, was it just a bunch of pansies who were alarmist and they hate Trump? They say that all in the same breath. And people have actually died from this. And I know that it's uh, good to be cold and reptilian when you look at hard data and make tough decisions. But these people have no shame. When it comes to the outbreaks in nursing homes that are clearly, and let me use some rough language here that I think represents their mentality, thinning the herd of old people who just don't have any value. And therefore, everyone else should be free to conduct business as usual and just hope they survive if they end up with the virus. And let me, you know, be candid that not everybody dies from it. A lot of people recover from it. But it is not limited to elderly people. And the impact on African Americans in this country is sharply higher than the rest of us. And these people seem to be cold and calculating, and the economy is more important, and therefore, ah, just let some people die. They're going to die anyway, right? So in a stunning reversal, yesterday in his televised antics, Trump completely reversed himself from what began as this fight with state governors on Monday. Began with a tweet in the morning and then his showy performance on television that evening when he swaggered and said it's the president who calls the shots. Total power. Those kinds of comments that he made. Well, yesterday, he completely reversed himself. And so we've seen his narcissism, his paranoia, his fear of criticism. And now, are we seeing a man exhibiting schizophrenia? Because which Trump are we supposed to believe? He, he announced yesterday that we're not all opening at once, that governors have the prerogative to decide how their states will restart, emerge from the uh, restrictions that we have all been under. Well, not everybody. Some states just blithely gone forward. And I give credit to Rachel Maddow, who's been a little bit obsessive about South Dakota. But there is a huge cluster of cases coming from that meatpacking plant that's been shut down. And the governor, who is a dyed-in-the-wool trumper, has refused to impose any restrictions. So at the briefing on Thursday, Trump conceded that the choice of how and when to open, to reopen the country, would not be his. If they need to remain closed, he said, referring to the states, we will allow them to do that. <laughs> now, he's clinging to the idea that he has just graciously and benevolently relented. But it appears somebody schooled him on the Constitution. And he figured out that uh, it's better for him to avoid responsibility for a state that reopens under his behest and then faces a fresh outbreak or a cluster of coronavirus cases. In a quote from the Times article, he has lurched from one position to another as his administration has struggled to confront what he calls an invisible enemy. And you know the history of how he played it down 
and then said he knew it was a pandemic all along and blah, blah, blah. But then, as if to divert our attention from his retreat, he went on a tweet shitstorm. And I guess he retweeted to distract against the retreat as well. But as I've pointed out over the last couple of days, these phony protests, starting in Michigan and Ohio, now spreading to Kentucky. There's a rally in Austin, Texas this weekend, driven by one of Alex Jones' cronies. The Proud Boys are part of the movement in Michigan. And one of the leaders of the Michigan protest is a major Trumper. Uh, he uses the name Oda Kirk or something like that. And what is stunning to me is that this is truly fake news. As I pointed out, it is designed to produce colorful B-roll. The video footage that Laura Ingram plays as she tries to gin up a firestorm of rebellion across the country. But this is a well-funded and carefully orchestrated effort to develop the illusion that people are demanding their rights, they're pulling out their guns, they're saying, this shall not stand, live free or die. It's fake news. This is the real fake news, if that's not too oxymoronic. <laughs> and I am stunned by the false equivalency delivered in Friday's New York Times about these protests. About paragraph four here. The rallies reflected both economic frustrations and political divides. At recent rallies in Ohio, New York, and Michigan, many organizers and demonstrators, some who came armed, were aligned with anti-government activists on the right and libertarian groups. At least one protester in Michigan waved a Confederate flag with the image of a gun. Others waved banners in support of Mr. Trump and protested Governor Gretchen Whitmer, a Democrat who has been a target of Trump, by chanting, lock her up. So this is a thinly veiled, AstroTurf operation, and the New York Times treats it, you know, kind of even-handedly. Now, everybody is suffering through economic frustrations except the super wealthy who've gotten the best of the, the pork that's in the CARES Act. And some of the people quoted in this story later on acknowledge. Here's Melissa Ackeson a Republican candidate for state Senate in Ohio. She used social media, talk radio, her campaign's email list. We can shoot things out and rile people up pretty quickly, she said. And then the sage observers at the time cite polling, showing divides between Democrats and Republicans in their responses to the virus. But in an article in the same damn newspaper on the same damn day, they cite a, a recent Pew Research Center study found that Americans' attitudes toward the pandemic vary sharply depending on where they get their news. Just 35% of people who mostly watch MSNBC said the media had exaggerated the risks of the virus, compared with 79% of people who mostly watch Fox News and 54% for CNN. And they don't even include the uh, new entry on the right-wing channels, the One American News Network, which fawns over Trump in ways that are just grotesque. And I honestly have not had uh, heard any commentary or taken the trouble to watch OAN to see just how bad it is these days. So as part of the distraction campaign, Trump went on Twitter this morning. He clearly has little to do but watch Foxy Friends and play with his phone. So he went on a series of rants and, in the voice of the Washington Post, embraced a weird sort of middle ground supporting opponents of distancing measures indirectly by calling on states to be liberated from the restrictions less than 24 hours after he himself offered guidelines to governors about how to do it safely. So... He's not just having it both ways. He's trying to have it all ways. One quote, 
one tweet, <laughs> sorry, uh, all caps, two words, liberate Minnesota, exclamation point. Did you know that uh, Minnesota needs liberation? Then he said to liberate Virginia and uh, restore their gun rights. And he's oblivious to the fact that many of these states do not meet the criteria to relax their restrictions that he enumerated less than 24 hours ago. And this is the man who wants everybody to kneel down and to accept his authority without question or limit. Pardon my language, but it's fucking bizarre. And what's even more bizarre is that people accept this, and so many of his cult members just lap it up and say, yes, sir, yes, sir. We need our freedom. Got to liberate us now. And as Gretchen Whitmer, the governor of Michigan, has pointed out, the people who were poking their noses in the windows of the Capitol, maybe you've seen that picture. They wore no face masks. They observed no distancing. They were likely yelling and spitting all over each other. And I don't wish ill even on these idiots. But it's not hard to predict that they have exposed themselves. They may carry the virus and not know it, not be symptomatic. They came from all over the great state of Michigan, which has a lake named after it. Great. <laughs> and now they've gotten in their pickup trucks and loaded up their guns and gone back home. And will there be a bounce a rebound of cases after they have successfully started to reduce hospitalizations, ventilator use. And as you know, this gets personal for me because Kathy's cousin died early on in Michigan, just as the hospitals were starting to get overloaded. And again, these people now... <laughs> irrationally argue that this was a nothing burger and they ignore that the restrictions that they now want lifted have flattened that damn curve. So, to be fair, there are many states that do appear to be in a position to lift some restrictions. In Texas, Greg Abbott, the Republican governor, is opening shopping next week to, in a way, it's called retail to go. So you can't go in the store, but you can place an order by phone or over the uh, Internet and go pick up your stuff. But he said that his advisors said that it's unsafe to return children to school. So schools will remain closed for the remainder of the year. Now, I don't want to infer any great brilliance to Greg Abbott. But I don't think that those are irrational decisions. Also in Minnesota, Governor Waltz, a Democrat, said that golfers can go back on the links and the driving ranges on Saturday. Now, I, I actually feel that it was unreasonable to suspend golfing. I don't spend any time. Uh, I, I don't have the shoes. I've got some old clubs. <laughs> I haven't been on a golf course in a long, long time. But I think you can responsibly play golf. And he's allowing boating, fishing, hunting, and hiking. Those are generally solitary or, you know, event, uh, activities that are conducted in very small groups. Often family members do it. And so I, I, I don't object to reasonable relaxation. Now, what's pretty darn disgusting, as I mentioned, Trump getting into these Twitter battles today, and he picked a fight with Andrew Cuomo. And he appeared to be watching Cuomo on TV, and his narcissism went into the red zone, his jealousy that a guy with great hair doesn't have to comb it over, good teeth, <laughs> and who can string together complete sentences, can cite statistics and present PowerPoint, in a way that is, uh, you know, pretty good narrative. So Trump attacked him, 
while Cuomo is doing his TV show because Cuomo said that he couldn't fully reopen the economy in New York without more widespread testing and that he can't do that without federal help. And he had a great line. He said that the president didn't name him, but the administration, the government, the federals, are passing the buck without passing the bucks. And even before Cuomo had finished speaking, Trump, who was apparently watching him, tweeted that the governor should spend more time doing and less time complaining. Now, that is sheer projection. Here's the guy who has hours of of his day blocked off for executive time where he watches TV, gets misinformed by people who are intentionally doing that, and then he gets on his Twitter box and tries to shit all over Cuomo. Get out there and get the job done, the president wrote. We built you thousands of hospital beds that you didn't need or use, gave large numbers of capital V ventilators that you should have had, and helped you with testing that you should be doing. He said Cuomo had never thanked the federal government for its assistance. And Andy didn't just sit there and take it. (laughs) He said, first of all, he's sitting home watching TV. Maybe he should get up and go to work, right? Second, let's keep emotion and politics out of this and personal ego if we can, (laughs) said one egomaniac to another, because this is about the people. Cuomo then acknowledged that Trump had moved quickly to mobilize the resources to build a 2,500-bed field hospital in the Javits Convention Center in Manhattan. He disputed the idea that the hospital hadn't been used, saying that 800 patients had been sent there. And he said, The number of beds that were set up there were based on federal projections. Then he whipped out his PowerPoint to display a graphic of federal projections that showed even in a best-case scenario the virus would kill at least 100,000 Americans. And looking at the glass eye, the TV camera, Cuomo said, They're your projections, Mr. President. If we were foolish for listening to you, then shame on us. He went on to say he'd already repeatedly thanked the federal government and said, what am I supposed to do, send a bouquet of flowers? Thank you again, Mr. President, for the Javits. Thank you for the U.S. Navy ship Comfort, which is just doing your job as president. It's not really thank you like you wrote a check yourself, (laughs) but thank you. (laughs) And Trump got in the last word, tweeting that Cuomo had ridiculously requested 40,000 ventilators when the state has needed far fewer. And again, this is that revisionism, that kind of backseat driver or, uh, you know, hindsight. Just say, hey, you know, you relied on my figures, but that doesn't matter. I'm going to blame you for it anyway. And I I don't believe that Andrew Cuomo deserves any kind of halo. I do think that he's shown much greater leadership than Trump. And I hear people say they'd like to see a backroom deal at the Democratic convention and knock over Joe Biden and insert Cuomo. Well, let me refer you to Anya Parampal's latest video interview with Randy Credico. Now, you may have heard of this guy. He was the one who came out as the honorable one in the Roger Stone trial. And by the way, Stone just uh, had a rejection of a demand for a retrial based on a juror he didn't like. But Credico is this guy who's worked for Pacifica Radio in in, uh, New York, WBAI. He's a sometime comedian. He's a political activist. He challenged Cuomo for the governorship in 2014, has known him for years. And I think you'll get the straight poop if you check out the video at the uh, grayzoneproject.com. And I believe, I, yeah, I have a link that will uh, lead you right to it. So here is today's COVID-19 update, edited by Linda Lewis. Worldwide, the death count is over 151,000. Uh, and the confirmed cases, based on variable standards, is about 2.2 million. In the U.S., we're edging up to 700,000 confirmed cases. 34,180 deaths. 
In New York, 630 people died of the virus in New York State on Thursday, where the total confirmed death toll there is、uh, edging up to 13,000. And one of the big leaps in the past week has been in New Jersey. And again, nursing homes, senior care have been the scenes of、uh, grisly multiple deaths. Some of which appeared to have been covered up where there was an attempt. But since last Friday, in seven days, the death toll there has more than、uh, nearly doubled from 1,933 to 3,840. So, in her report today, Linda details for us the standards of the articulation from Trump yesterday based on、uh, Dr. Deborah Burks. And they describe that in phase one, In states where the conditions have improved and、uh, the reports of new cases and hospitalizations and deaths are declining,、uh, this would、uh, recommend continued social distancing, the closure of schools, teleworking, sheltering in place for vulnerable individ- individuals, non essential travel would be discouraged, bars should remain closed, visits to nursing homes and hospitals remain prohibited. If a vulnerable population needs to return to work, there should be special accommodations for all vulnerable populations. In phase two, it would allow schools, restaurants, and bars to reopen with diminished occupancy. Non essential travel can resume and people can gather in groups no larger than 50, but teleworking is still encouraged. Now, remember, a lot of people don't have the option for telework. If you're a garbage collector or a plumber, just for example, you don't have the luxury of phoning it in. Then in phase three, it would allow workplaces to reopen with no restrictions. Visits to senior care centers and hospitals could resume. So those appear to me to be reasonable. Dr. Fauci appears to be bending over backwards to kiss Trump's ass. Because he left open the possibility that there could be professional sporting events with fans in the stands in phase three, and that that could be as soon as July or August. Now, I'm more likely to believe Mayor Garcetti of Los Angeles, who said,、uh, No, no, there's not going to be a baseball season. There are not going to be any concerts. Taylor Swift has acknowledged that. She's not going on the road this year at all. And so it's going to be uneven, and I, I accept that. But my fear is that the states who lift restrictions first may see a wave of new cases that could lead all of us back into hunker down mode. And Linda notes, as Governor Cuomo and others have articulated, that testing is the critical issue. And it is still not widely available, as Trump promised back at the CDC in Atlanta in early March. And so we remain in the dark about the metrics that are going to be used to take us through phase three, two, and one, or one, two, and three, whatever the order will be. And Linda also notes, and I had missed this in my other comments about Governor Abbott in Texas, that he is announcing that he'll loosen surgery restrictions at medical facilities. And as you know, Texas was one of the first states to say no abortions, it's non essential. And we don't have detail on whether the lifting of surgery restrictions or loosening of them would include the right to a woman to choose an abortion at this critical time. And I want to thank Linda for a detailed rundown on the blah, blah, blah back and forth between Dr. Phil and Dr. Oz and their appearances on television. And frankly, I'm going to pass on this whole thing. I have no respect for Dr. Phil. And Dr. Oz does have some credentials, but he has soiled himself repeatedly. And I'll just jump to the end of Linda's summary here, where she notes that it was Oprah Winfrey who first dis- discovered Dr. Phil and her syndication company made him a star and a very wealthy guy for peddling psycho babble on a daily basis. And also, Oprah discovered Oz. <laughs> not, the, <laughs> not, not the promised land of Oz, but the doctor whose apparent given name is、uh, Mehmet Oz. And I consider him to be a charlatan. 
And the Daily Beast of Dr. Daniel Summers writes, Oprah's role in creating the dual fame of these guys requires her to find a way to deal with them. He writes, is Oprah directly responsible for any of these recent statements? No. But since the miasma of ersatz authority, oh, I love that line, that still clings to these two is her handiwork, she should consider using her own own immeasurable fame and authority to waft it away. (laughs) Details uh, we're getting from the Death count from COVID here in California that hadn't been previously released confirm uh, trends similar to other parts of the country. New data released here in California shows that fatalities among African Americans are at the rate of 4.2 people per 100,000. Among white people, it's a mere 2.2 people for 100,000. Asians, 2.1 per 100,000. And Latinos, kind of in the middle there, 1.6 per 100,000. Also, it appears that the stock market rallied today, and I never believe some of these uh, people who just say they can tell why the market went up, but the official wisdom is that it's because a study that was leaked from a clinical trial in Chicago of the drug remdesivir showed some promise. And in the headline, Misleading at CNN, remdesivir, COVID-19 patients recovering quickly after getting experimental drug. Now, this report was leaked. And I'll get to who likely leaked it in a moment. But first, it was a study of a mere 125 patients. They had tested positive for COVID-19. They were given the drug. And we don't know the status of every one of those 125 people. But the indication is that only two of those who have been released so far have died. The doctor running the study is quoted here. Most of our patients are severe. Most of them are leaving at six days. So that tells us duration of therapy doesn't have to be 10 days. But it's not a controlled study. And without that, it doesn't have any real clinical or uh, medical value, in my opinion. And I'm not alone in that. But this trial is being run by the company that makes the drug. The price-gouging pharmaceutical firm called Gilead, based here in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I suspect that that's where the leak came from. I have a lot of compassion for people in prison, and I often decline to judge What sent them there? Michael Cohen, the fixer for Donald Trump, who was sentenced to a stretch in state prison for his role in paying hush money to the two women who claimed that they had affairs with Trump. And I'm okay with Michael Cohen getting released. He may have to go back when this passes, but even if he doesn't, I believe he has paid a price. And the real mastermind of the crime has gotten away with it. And on the flip side of that, ICE is still rounding up people, including those who are under quarantine for COVID-19. And a man in the Washington, D.C. area was spirited away in the middle of the night to process his uh, deportation. His wife, a nurse in a D.C. hospital, condemned the actions As a nurse, I can't believe ICE is willing to risk the safety of others by transferring somebody who's in quarantine. And get this. We have been dumping people who've tested positive in Guatemala, a nation that has very limited capacity to deal with anyone who gets seriously ill. But we've been packing planes with deportees dumping them in Guatemala, and the Guatemalan government has asked the U.S. to send no more than 25 people per flight, but that has been ignored. Jerry Falwell Jr., as you know, defied the trend there ordered by the governor in Virginia, and he reopened Liberty University in Lynchburg after their spring break. And now the number of people testing positive in the general area there is 78, 
and that's the campus area. I don't have an explicit uh, geography, uh, geographically defined area. One person has died. A Lynchburg City cop has tested positive. And Jerry Falwell's uh, response is not to pray to the Lord. And he's not actually blaming gays like his daddy did. But he's attacking the media. He has pursued arrest warrants for trespassing against two journalists, one a reporter from ProPublica and the other a freelance photographer for the New York Times. And he called a, a Times reporter just before midnight recently, leaving a voicemail saying, you're in some serious trouble. He accused the journalists of putting his students at risk because they traveled from New York, which in fact they had not. So he just embraces the Trump method, attack, lie, blame somebody else, particularly the media. (laughs) Oh, boy. There's been a wave of suspension and dismissal of nurses who went public with their complaints of inadequate protective gear. This is occurring in Oakland, California, where a recently hired male nurse who was given rave reports on his work, was terminated during his initial higher probationary period after a photo of him wearing a trash bag was distributed in the media. And that's not all. In Santa Monica, at Providence St. John's Health Center, personnel have been suspended for complaining about the lack of protective gear. California, uh, for several weeks now, has had an order from the governor suspending evictions. That was followed up by the uh, judicial bar, the state Supreme Court and the related judicial network, who ordered the courts not to accept any filings for eviction until the restrictions are lifted, and I think they gave a date of the end of May. But a dozen renters and their attorneys have told The Guardian, which is based in Britain and does, as I say, better reporting on a lot of these issues than uh, the media outlets right here. They profile a series of individuals who are facing eviction. And one is a woman across the bay from me in Alameda. That's next to Oakland. And she was the apartment manager, right? So she got a break in her rent to fix toilets and report problems and maybe collect the rent. And her name is Crystal McMorris, 29. She's pregnant. She works, uh, has worked for six years for FPI management. And after the pandemic was declared, FPI terminated her position, told her she had 30 days to move, despite the eviction moratorium. And when she asked the company to let her stay until the emergency had passed, her boss despite knowing she's pregnant, responded that she does not have rights. It could force her out in three days, but instead they gave her until today. And Crystal, if you happen to be listening, I don't know how many people in Alameda listen to this podcast. I just want to remind you of the Peter B. Collins Podcast Community Fund. And I can't pay your entire rent, but we're giving out grants of $100 to deserving people who listen to this podcast. And today, I don't have any requests for a grant. I want to encourage you. If you could use 100 bucks to help get you through this period, don't be shy. Don't feel any shame. And if you want me to disguise your identity, just put that in the note that you send. I want to thank two recent donors. Ed Lowe, who is a longtime subscriber to this podcast, uses the handle Mad Ed. There's a lot to be mad about, Ed, I understand, but control your anger. He chipped in an extra 25 bucks this month. And the volunteer, chief engineer of the Peter B. Collins podcast here at the Secret Studio, my longtime friend Raul Velez, he dropped a Benjamin into the bucket, and I'm really grateful for your support, Raul. And if you want to send money or ask for money, Use the same email address, peter at peterbcollins.com. As I've mentioned, if you don't like PayPal, you can mail it to Box 150 660 San Rafael, California, 94915. And this offer is good to all listeners of this podcast uh, all around the globe. 
about a third of our listeners, it's estimated, uh, live outside the United States. And I'm proud of that. Now, to help people with rent issues, Minnesota Congresswoman and scourge of the right-wingers, Ilan Omar, has introduced a bill that would cancel rent and mortgage payments for millions of Americans who are struggling right now through a federal program. It would uh, be retroactive to cover April rent payments, and it would use federal funds to clear renter protections. It says here, in order to receive funds, landlords and lenders would be required to follow a set of fair renting and lending practices for five years. These terms would prohibit rent increases, evictions without cause, discrimination against voucher holders. That's uh, HUD Section 8. And I want to note here that there are a lot of landlords who are not greedy M- uh, MFs or evil people. And they have to pay their mortgage and the other costs, the taxes, the utilities. And so we need across-the-board relief that protects particularly small landlords, many of whom, you know, have put their savings into an income property to try to live the American dream. And one of my local council members had an op-ed in today's local newspaper promoting an idea, not his, but uh, that's floating around out there, that one of the ways that we could help small business people who are not getting money from the Paycheck Protection Program or the SBA disaster funds because all the money's been uh, taken, and some people were told, well, uh, you got to go to the end of the line because you're an independent contractor or you're a gig worker. Well, one way to deal with this that is simple is to allow people to overdraw their accounts with either subsidized funds or interest-free arrangements. And, you know, I can't figure out all the details of that, but as a concept, it appeals to me. And here's one of the people. Profiled in today's New York Times, Doug Martin, a sports marketer from Long Beach here in California, he went to three banks to try to get a loan under the paycheck, uh, no, the SBA, uh, disaster money. So his main bank is Wells Fargo. He's got an account there. Wells Fargo has never responded to his application. So then he went to U.S. Bank, which told him it couldn't take his application because he's a customer of Wells Fargo. (laughs) Then he asked a smaller bank, Commerce West, for help. And it turned him down because he's not a customer. So that kind of bullshit and uh, run around red tape is so insulting, particularly to people who pay their taxes and play by the rules, as Bill Clinton once famously said. The French are reeling from a wave of infections. 1,000 sailors in the Charles de Gaulle carrier group have tested positive. That's 1,000 out of 2,300. And the French government, which initially rejected ideas of using cell phone tracking and other digital intrusive means, is now considering doing just that. Now, I understand the importance of contact tracing and that if we're going to wipe out this virus, we got to know who the person who tests positive might have given it to. But as I went on a great length about last Friday, I reject using Google and Facebook and my Apple iPhone location device and even the Bluetooth system that's supposed to protect my privacy. And the Republican governor of Massachusetts, Charlie Baker, is rejecting digital intrusion. He doesn't want to track your phone. He is hiring a 1,000 people to get on the phone and call people who test positive and just talk to them and say, okay, tell us who you came into contact with in the last seven days or whatever the designated period is. That way people have control over giving that information. And I saw in passing a headline about a woman who has been working at home and doing all these Zoom conferences, and she's afraid that her co-workers are going to discover her secret baby. Now, I don't know why her baby is secret, but damn it, it's her right to control her privacy. And if she doesn't want people to know she's got a baby, 
I support her right to do so. Interesting tip here that came from our longtime contributor who is in Royal Oak outside Detroit. That's Merle Kyle. And he said he heard about this on the Tom Hartman radio show. This is a report from a television station in Israel, Channel 12. The U.S. government reportedly gave Israel advanced warning over the emerging threat the coronavirus posed in China mid-November 2019. The report says U.S. intelligence agencies became aware of the danger posed by COVID-19 as it battered the central city of Wuhan in Hubei province in China. The information was then handed over to the White House, which, quote, did not deem it of interest. (laughs) Okay. And speaking of Israel, they're now in a last-ditch attempt to prevent a fourth election in a year. And this is not likely to produce any result. But under the routine there, the uh, figurehead president of Israel, Reuven Rivlin, has given the Knesset 21 days to try to form a government. Now, Benny Gantz, whose only political difference from Benjamin Netanyahu is that he's not currently indicted for corruption. They are uh, pretty much on the same page when it comes to vilifying the Palestinians and preserving the Zionist mentality. But Benny Gantz blew up the Blue and White Party when he, in a last-ditch effort, tried to form a power-sharing government with Netanyahu. But Bibi wouldn't budge from his demand that he had to be immune from prosecution under the very carefully investigated corruption charges for at least a two-year period, and then he would hand the baton to Benny Gantz. And in accepting that compromise, Gantz compromised himself because it blew up his coalition. And can the Knesset... Now deal with that? I doubt it. Residents of Arizona's borderlands in the community of Ajo are really pissed because crews from all over the country are converging there to work on the project of building Trump's vanity border wall. And the residents are concerned about the spread of COVID-19 from these crews that come in and work and then go home every weekend. The so-called man camp in Columbus, New Mexico, was built last week in the middle of town to house construction workers. And the mayor there, of course I'm concerned. He said that uh, the wall wall construction company uh, sent a letter to request that they could hold... Oh, he sent a letter to them to request that they hold off their move into the man camp until at least April... Yesterday, Uh, so... (laughs) That, that wasn't much to ask for. And this news comes from the Customs and Border Patrol wing near San Diego. And they are admitting that last September, in a one-month span, there were 18 successful breaches of the newly constructed border wall along areas that did have a fence before. So this doesn't represent a, an extension or, you know, a new barrier on the border. It was just an upgrade to the new uh, materials and concept called the bollards. Well, and there's a big defect because the bollards are anchored in concrete in the ground. They go up like uh, 30 feet, and then they are uh, connected across the top in a barrier that's supposed to block people from climbing up and down. But there's no horizontal reinforcement which makes it easy for them to use a $100 reciprocating saw, and they're battery-powered for your convenience, to cut through the wall and uh, open up enough for uh, a sizable adult or a package of drugs to penetrate Trump's imaginary wall. So a group of 66 representatives and 25 senators, all Democrats, have sent a letter to Trump officials calling for the suspension a border wall construction during the pandemic. Attorney General Bill Barr, the president's personal lawyer, he published an open letter Thursday asking Facebook, 
to alter its plan to fully encrypt Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, and Instagram. Now, I've got my criticism of Facebook, but I fully support their end-to-end encryption. But like James Comey and others in the uh, administration of justice in this country, they believe they have a right to get a warrant and crack into your communications. And this is a fight that certainly will continue. Also in the Facebook file, they're bragging over at uh, the Thumbs Up Company that they have warned millions of people about misinformation about the coronavirus. And they've done it, I've seen these, uh, by putting up a flag saying this post may contain misinformation. And you can click on that link where they present what they call are fact checkers facts. And this is a big intrusion on freedom of expression. I believe I'm entitled to see people who are critical, even if I think they're misguided, even if I think that they are using bad data to support their points or no data at all. And it's up to me to decide if I think that this is a reasonable and rational expression or something that I don't want to read. And get this, if you click on one of those and they claim that these warnings have caused 95% of people not to click on them, and we know that they also use their algorithms to limit people seeing them in the first place, but if you do click on one of these, they send you a follow-up alert saying, hey, you have been infected with information that we don't approve of. But they don't even tell you what article or post or link that you clicked on was deemed offensive or out of bounds. I want to recommend a podcast over at Who, What, Why. You can listen to it at your leisure this weekend. My colleague Jeff Schechtman handed off the mic to Emily Levy. And Emily is an activist from the Santa Cruz area here in California, founder and director of the nonprofit election integrity group called Scrutineers.org. And she took the mic and interviewed a lawyer and election integrity activist who's nonpartisan from Madison, Wisconsin. Well, she's in Wisconsin. I'm, I'm not sure about Madison. Her name is Summer Murshid. And they take you through step by step the machinations that led to the attempt to cancel or postpone the election, then the effort to extend the mail-in voting deadline, all that were scuttled by the Wisconsin State Supreme Court and the intervention of Brett Kavanaugh, who presides over that region, and the United States Supreme Court denying the governor in his last-minute effort to uh, impose a delay on that election. Now, as I said the other day, it's completely tainted no matter what you think about the fact that the Democrat, I can't summon her name, but she defeated uh, a right-wing Wisconsin State Supreme Court justice who was up for re-election. So there are a lot of people now who like the outcome, even though <laughs> it was a totally corrupt process. And it's hard for me to separate the two. For your weekend reading, I recommend the latest post at consortiumnews.com by my buddy Pepe Escobar. He cites Confucius to describe how the response in Asian nations to the pandemic was serene in comparison with the West's fear, panic, and hysteria. Get yourself some Pepe. It's always a satisfying read with uh, interesting references. And, as you may know, Pepe is an exile self-imposed from Brazil. Last year, we celebrated his exclusive interview with the former president, Lula da Silva, who was railroaded into prison. And I can't vouch for the non-corruption of anybody in Brazil. Uh, the entire power structure there has been uh, corrupt for a long time. But Lula does represent working people, and he is slamming the current president, Jair Bolsonaro. Lula said that by undermining social distancing and firing his own health minister, that Brazil's troglodyte leader is risking repeating the devastating scenes playing out in Ecuador, where families have had to dump their loved ones' corpses in the streets. 
Lula. Unfortunately, I fear Brazil is going to suffer a great deal because of Bolsonaro's recklessness. I fear that if this grows, Brazil could see some cases like those horrific, monstrous images we saw in Guayaquil. We can't just want to topple a president because we don't like him. But if Bolsonaro continues to commit crimes of responsibility, trying to lead society to the slaughterhouse, which is what he is doing, I think the institutions will need to find a way of sorting Bolsonaro out, and that means impeachment. And that's what was used to replace Lula's hand-picked successor, who was drummed out of the government uh, several years ago. And finally today, I thought I would never, ever say something nice about the right-wing radio host and overall nut job who uses the name Michael Savage. His given name is Michael Weiner, And Savage was an early supporter of Donald Trump. Trump appeared on his radio show several times, and Savage slobbered all over him. And before I get to a momentary praise of Savage, I'll just tell you that, uh, you know, I'm from a big family in Cincinnati, a lot of conservatives there, and at a family reunion five, six years ago, my cousin, we'll call him David because that's his name, he came up to me and he was real excited because he knew I worked in radio in San Francisco. And he said, Peter, do you know Michael Savage? Have you ever met him? And I said, Dave, uh, I've worked in the same building with him at the same time. And I'm proud to say I've managed to avoid him <laughs> all these years. And we have never had to exchange uh, pleasantries or unpleasantries. But I'm here to say that uh, Dr. Savage, as his listeners revere him and call him, and he does have a Ph.D., he has taken on what he calls the pimps in the right-wing media who tell you what you want to hear. They are intellectual dwarfs, science illiterates, he said. And he is the outlier who doesn't minimize the threat from the coronavirus and in this profile in the New York Times, with no small amount of self-satisfaction, Savage reminds people of his credentials, a Ph.D. in training in epidemiology, and the fact that he was one of the few voices in conservative media who had warned them all along. Savage has attacked the credibility of the conservative media, accused its biggest stars of being too rote and unthinking in their defense of the president, and demand that they be held accountable for misleading millions of Americans. Quote, we're living in a terrible time in America where truth has died. This is crazy. Pointing to the way the president's defenders always accuse the left of spreading fake news. How can we not let our side be called on the carpet when they lie to the people? His contempt for hosts like Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, uh, is especially searing. He mocks them as Dr. Hannity and Rush Limbaugh, MD, PhD. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks for listening all the way to the bitter end of my daily news and podcast comment. I'm going to take the weekend off. I'm going to try to watch Lady Gaga and the other artists uh, who are going to commandeer every channel in America on Saturday evening. And I'll be back here Monday with another podcast for you. You'll find it on YouTube. And I remain Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you Until we meet again Happy trails